Welcome to another edition of NASCAR America at Home with Kyle Petty and Parker Kligerman. And I guess you could say NASCAR and IndyCar's crossover event over the 4th of July weekend had fireworks, well, lightning, had uh, extreme heat, over 130 degrees in the cars. We'll get to that. But Kyle, is it safe to say that it may have also had divine intervention? Dustin Long has a story about uh, Rodney Childers' decision to pit early. <laughs> well, I, I think Rodney... Uh, believes that it probably did. Uh, he was um, awake or woken at, at three o'clock in the morning and he thought to himself, you know what, if we do the same strategy, if we follow in the tire tracks of the car in front of us, we're not going to get in front of them. We've got to come up with a new strategy. I'm going to pit before the competition caution. Uh, and I think it had a lot of people scratching their heads. Whether it worked or not, I'm not sure because he caught a caution later that put him in position and kept his track position. Uh, so that helped, that worked, uh, but it had people up and down pit road and everybody on the NBC broadcast, Junior and, and Latart and all those guys scratching their head. Why did we pit? Why did he pit at this point in time? Um, but I, I do believe there was divine intervention yesterday because there were, there, even though they had a strategy, strategy without execution is useless. Uh, let, me, let me say that. They had a strategy, uh, but they did not execute the way we see them execute a lot of times. There was a miscommunication on pitting. Uh, there were things that went on, a slow pit stop. We looked at that. And really the divine intervention came uh, when, when the 11 car of Denny Hamlin had that final accident or, or had that tire go down uh, and got into the wall. That was the divine intervention for those guys to win the race. But um, you got to give it to Rodney. Uh, think outside the box, make them follow me, at least make them think about me. And I think that's what he did when they pitted early. I, so first of all, uh, three o'clock in the morning, wake up, my girlfriend would say that's definitely ghost inspired because that's supposed to mean spirits are in the place you're sleeping. So I don't know what that means, but maybe it's a little divine intervention. Um, but you said it, you know, Rodney getting up that early and working for an hour and a half. That is so Rodney Childers. He has told me so many times over the last couple of years, I've sat down and talked to him about a weekend. He says, yeah, you know, I got up early, you know, four in the morning, I've been running sim or I've been doing this for two or three hours. And that's just what he does. You know, Steve Latart talked about after the race, how quiet and demeanored he is, right? And that he's sort of so reserved, yet he's this incredible hard worker, this incredible thinker who thinks outside the box. And I think that's a lot of times what's been the key to success for that four car is that they are not afraid to kind of step out of what everyone else thinks is convention and do something different. And we see it every week in the setup of that four car. You know, they talked about the broadcast, super trimmed out. There's so many people over the last year and a half that have asked themselves, how is that car able to go so fast with so little downforce and so fast down the straightaway? And no one has been able to replicate it like that four car. So I think that it's a, it's a great embodiment of what makes that team great. Yes, did they get a little lucky in the end with the 11 car, Kyle, as you said? I, I think so, you know, because it looked kind of like they lost this race. Um, but, hey, look, you just, a lot of times we say NASCAR, you got to be in position to win, right? And he was in position because of what they did. Okay, so on the other side of things, yeah, you have Denny Hamlin, who I think the word he used after the race was gutted um, to not win his first Brickyard. But certainly, Parker, that sort of leads us into this, this tire discussion. I mean, tires at Indianapolis – it's a conversation we've had before. Yeah, we've been having this conversation for, um, well, 20 years. So I was about nine years old then, um, and it's been continuing on ever since, <laughs> or maybe before that. I mean, this, this discussion has gone on and on and on. And I think for the competitors, it's frustrating, right? It is frustrating to think that something entirely maybe out of your control that you don't build, that you don't make, that you don't have any control over the design of, fails on you and takes away a chance at winning a race. But in the way that we've designed motorsports, you know, with a single tire supplier, I, I think the notion that, you know, as fans and as viewers, sometimes we think like it's their job to provide something that creates great racing. And that is just a, is not true, right? For Goodyear, their job is to provide as safe a tire as they can. And I think a lot of times as a sport, we've pigeonholed them at times into thinking, Hey, look, we need to make this great tire. And it's just not exactly what it is. And I don't want to, I don't want to harp on them, you know, because I look at other race series out there. You look at Firestone, you look at Michelin, you look at V8 supercars in Australia with Dunlop. They don't have these issues, but then again, they don't take 3,400 pound stock cars and put them around the track going 185 miles an hour to a corner, Kyle. And maybe that's just the, the physics alone are impossible to overcome. 
Yeah, I, I, and, and I agree. And look, Goodyear is in a, a non-winnable situation. They, they create a tire that is it, that will last and will hold up and is fine. And the drivers complain because it's undrivable. Uh, they don't like it. They can't be competitive. They create a tire that is competitive. Uh, and then we have issues. And, and listen, there is a reason. Um, and we saw where Greg Stuckey said, uh, there's a reason, is, and this is Kyle saying this, there's a reason there is a, a decal on the top of a ladder that says, do not use this top step to stand on. Uh, because somebody has fallen off of it before, and that's their disclaimer. There is a reason that Goodyear says recommended air pressure. Listen to what we're telling you. This is the air pressure we're saying run. You go below that, it's on you. So I look at some of the tire failures that we've had in the past, whether it be at Indy, whether it be another place, it's self-induced. It's self-induced with camber. It's self-induced uh, with air pressure. You are taking a product that was designed for one thing, and you are manipulating that and, and using it in a different way. Yes, Denny Hamlin should have been gutted. For the 19th week in a row, I guess, he's had a dominant car. He and the four car of Kevin Harvick or whatever week it is. You look at him and he could have won all the big races this year, uh, which is a phenomenal for that team. But at the same time, I think Goodyear does a fantastic job. You've got to go back to the Speedway surface. It's very abrasive. You've got to go back to this downforce package, the speeds that they're carrying through the, through the corners. We heard Jeff Burton and Steve Latart talk about it yesterday. The speeds are up in the center of the corners, which puts more load on the tires, which changes everything. So Goodyear's chasing a moving target, just as the teams are. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I can't blame Goodyear. I can't blame the teams. I don't blame anybody. This is just a part of racing. And NASCAR, it's always been this way. And as you said, that's why we're still talking about it 20 years later on stock cars, on heavy stock cars, and not in other forms of racing. Kyle, you brought up a good point, which is, you know, I raced there last year in this race. And what struck me was that we were literally at times flat out around Indianapolis Motor Speedway in a 3,400 pound stock car. It's unnatural, right? It's we're, we're doing things. Then add in, as you brought up, teams are going to push that that product that Goodyear gives them to the nth degree because that's how they're going to extract performance out of it. And they're going to push it further than recommended because to them, that's their job, right? Exploit every exploit possible. But in doing so, you put yourself in that danger zone of say, of, hey, look, that's somewhere we told you not to go. If you're going to go there, by all means, you're going to pay the price if it goes wrong. And I think maybe that's a little bit we saw because we didn't see every car blow a tire. This wasn't 2008 Indianapolis all over again. It was a specific set of cars, late in runs, maybe maybe they were abusing the right front too far that had that issue. But I, uh, I, I think you said it best when, they're, when you said Goodyear's not, is in a no-win situation. They literally can't win in this situation, and I, it's really tough. But when we look at the new generation car, we're changing that wheel and tire setup. And I, you know, I think there's a little bit of this in there for why we're doing that. Well, Parker, you mentioned being behind the wheel last year. I mean, you guys as drivers, let's throw into the mix the element of there was no practice. What is it like, or put um, viewers behind the wheel of driving into turn one with that kind of load, that kind of speed, with that kind of unpredictability? It's, it's weird. I, uh, so I did, first time I raced this year in this sort of format was the truck race at Pocono. Um, and it was so odd showing up, hopping in the truck, doing some pace laps, and then just barreling off into turn one as hard as we could never had seen it other than doing it on iRacing before so it's really tough and I think Pocono and Indy were great examples of probably the toughest places because you carry so much speed down that straightaway into such a tight corner where you just you know a lot of times in practice that first lap or even that first corner coming out of the pits on the warm-up lap you feel how the car sort of sets in the corner you feel the steering box out you feel a lot of little things that give you sort of mental notes of like all right this is how it's going to react when I dive off in that corner but when you do it without any practice, without anything in race situation, you're basically figuring all that out in a five second span in a group of cars where the arrow is terrible and the car could move around and do everything and you have no control over that. So it's, uh, it's an incredibly tough thing to do. And, and I think the drivers and the teams are enjoying the challenge and we're enjoying it as viewers, but it, I can't emphasize enough how hard it is. Yeah, I can't listen. Um, in my days of racing, I wouldn't have driven my race car through the tunnel in anything but first gear wide open, uh, okay? I couldn't, can't imagine going off in a corner uh, with no practice, with nothing in those old stock cars that, that we raced. 
uh, if we go back to the 90s and early 2000s. But I, I think that, that the technology that they have um, and, and the simulators and, and all the computer programs that they run, and, and they have such faith in what a Rodney Childers can do. It's what the engineers can do. It's what they set under. Talk to Joey Logano on numerous occasions, and it's just like second nature to him. Um, he said those first couple of races at Darlington and stuff, they just kind of eased into it. And once they realized, hey, this is the way it's going to be, it's, they're very aggressive on these opening laps now. They just barrel off in there, and they're racing from lap one. So um, it's just a different time. And my hat is off to every one of them because I cannot, even though I drove a race car for 30 years, I can't imagine ever doing that. I never did it in practice. I can't imagine doing it under race conditions. And Kyle, just to add on to that, I think it has been a huge win. Because you yes. see smaller teams are having a tremendous amount of success in these last couple races that we haven't seen in recent years. And I really attribute a lot of it to the bigger teams just can't hone in as perfectly as they normally would and therefore are left a little vulnerable to those smaller teams that hit on something. And I think that's been a really cool byproduct of all this lack of practice qualifying. Well, we're about out of time, uh, but I do want to say it's not just the drivers uh, who show that bravery. It's, it's the pit crew members, as we saw yesterday as well. Uh, we're going to continue to, to send our thoughts out to, to Zach Price and his family. He was treated at a local hospital, was able to fly home uh, with the team. So um, we're all thinking, of course, of Zach um, was the member of Ryan Blaney's pit crew who was hit there on pit road. I guess we still have some stuff to talk about. I mean, we're just sort of touching on that. Um, we didn't mention guys like Eric Almarola, Michael McDowell. You guys cool if we come back tomorrow and uh, continue the conversation? Let's do it. Good. All right, we'll see you then. Hey, Motorsports fans, thanks for watching. Make sure you hit subscribe before you go for all the latest news and highlights across motorsports.